if you have a, a Scala's learn, or, sorry, O'Reilly's uh, learning platform subscription, you can actually start reading the updates. But what I'll do is I'll walk you through some of the examples here. Um, I've also been blogging about Scala 3 on Medium. If you like go to, if you like Google Medium and Scala-3, you'll find these blog posts. I'm a little behind. I need to do some catching up or I won't uh, be done by the time Scala 3 comes out. Um, uh, so I noticed that uh, um, uh, some of the Scala folks were online here. I hope you get that language out reasonably soon, but uh, no rush, no pressure. Um, I, I heard you, you said you've been talking about the new uh, brace versus indentation syntax. So I won't just talk about that explicitly, but I'll just point out some examples. I actually decided to go all in on that for the book since it's about Scala 3. Uh, I actually, to be quite honest, I didn't like the idea when I first heard about it because it seemed to me it was just uh, kind of a, let's call it gratuitous change for lack of a better word, not something that's strictly necessary to make the language better, but I kind of understand why it's done. I, as you said, when, when I joined, kind of embracing maybe uh, more appeal to Python programmers. And I'll be honest, I actually kind of like it now that I've used it a bit. So, um, oh, in fact, you can see some examples here. I was playing with some of the uh, new syntax that isn't necessarily brace related, but like here's a for loop where, um, you know, it's, uh, it, yeah, I just do four I from zero until nine, and then you can actually do an end for if you want, and you can do end method name or end class name, whatever. So that's another little bit of that syntax. I haven't actually used this really in anger. It, there've been a few classes that I've written that are fairly big, and that's why it's here so that you have a good, you know, place to know when you've reached the end of something without counting tabs or whatever. But, um, it's one of the ways that you can write things a little different. You know, while I'm here, you can do things like, you know, if I, uh, let's say if one is greater than two, uh, here I am falling into old habits. You don't need uh, parentheses if you do this, then you can do things like this. Um, uh, change, okay, I think if I do, how about this? Yeah, so, um, the, you can have these new keywords like then, uh, so you uh, can drop the uh, parentheses and stuff. And I went ahead and, like I said, went with all of that. But let me, let's talk about something that maybe you've heard a lot about, but I think is really pretty interesting, which is the new context uh, abstractions. And these are basically implicit. So, you know, what's coming that's different there. And the argument for this change is that implicit is kind of a low level mechanism. And we've all learned all of these sort of idiosyncratic patterns of using it to do various things. And so what they're doing in Scala 3 is actually introducing some new terminology in, in some sense, call it that, that it tries to be a little bit more explicit about the purpose, even though the old implicits are going to be supported uh, for backwards compatibility for a while. But we can go into a little bit about why this is happening. So let me find that spot in my uh, sample code here. Um, Oh, I know where it is. Sorry, you can see I've got a lot of code. Uh, you, if you go to my GitHub repo, uh, you can find all this code now. It's not well commented because it's typically used inside um, uh, the book where I do comment on things. But anyway, let's start with one like our old friend Arrowsos. You remember this is the thing that lets you do you know a arrow b and it returns a two element tuple. Well, one way to do this now in Scala three is that they've introduced true extension methods. So instead of instantiating you know, a, a class that does an implicit conversion to an arrow associate object, uh, you know, basically the, if I, let me just write that, like the old way is something like this, where there's you know, this class, you know, arrow associate, you know, some type A, and you pass it an A of A, and then, um, you know, there's this, uh, and actually I'll talk about the, some of the, the annotations you're seeing here. You know, then it was this, right? It would, uh, you'd call the arrow and it would return an, uh, a tuple. That's sort of the old way to do it. But now we have an extension method where this will actually, for any type A and B, uh, and again, we want this to work for every type in the type system. Um, I can now add a new method and I just use tilde uh, here just so that it wouldn't collide with the existing method of the true arrow. Um, and uh, basically does the same thing. So this is the new way that you'd write something like this. Implicit, or I should say, yeah, implicit conversions are much less common now because a lot of stuff you'll do with extension methods instead. So this is a really valuable thing. We've, kn we've known we needed it for a while in Scala uh, and it's pretty exciting. There, there's a couple of other interesting things to know here that I'm showing. 
Uh, the recommendation now, and I think these might eventually become warnings or, or even errors if you don't do this, if you want something to be used as an operator, um, add the infix notation. Now, in fact, you don't have to do this if it actually uses operator symbols like this. So this actually doesn't require the infix notation or the infix annotation. But if I had, you know, if I had a second method, you know, like uh, def um, asos or whatever that, uh, you know, just called, you know, this, um, then I would have to have an annotation eventually for that to be allowable in infix notation. So that's another way of kind of constraining what you can do. There are some interesting um, exceptions to this. The collection methods either, you know, we're all used to writing like foo, space, map, space, block. Um, I think all of those will still work out of the box either because they'll be annotated with infix. But it also turns out, um, if I just get rid of this, if you do something like, um, you know, uh, let's say list, map, and then something like this, if it sees a curly brace, it will also allow it without the annotation functions. So that's kind of an interesting little twist for that. The alpha annotation is actually put it, is, this is the name that will be used for this method in bytecode, as I understand it, rather than some synthesized name that the compiler would generate. And the purpose being that now you have a, a, you know, a fixed name that you decide that could then be used by Java code that wants to call this library. However, you cannot reference this method in Scala code with this um, uh, you know, new name, this alias, if you will. You'd have to define you know, a separate function like arrow two uh, if you really wanted to do that. Um, and Seth, correct anything I'm saying wrong here. I see you online, and uh, so hopefully I got all of this right. If you don't, it'll be in the book. So make sure you pipe in if I make mistakes here. Um, by the way, um, if you just have one extension method, you actually don't need the colon. But if you have a colon, then, uh, and again, I'm using this braceless syntax. It's like a, I've declared a type and I can have as many methods as I want. So I really could add a new method or whatever here, and it would be part of the same uh, type. So extension methods, a lot of what we do with uh, implicit conversions will just go away and just use extension methods. And it'll be much more concise. And once again, much more obvious what we're doing. Whereas if you look at a implicit conversion, if you're a newbie to Scala, you may not uh, really know exactly what's going on until you understand how they're used. Um, and that kind of leads to the interesting case of, of, um, uh, of type classes. So what you'll notice about this is that if I wanted to actually implement a separate version of this arrow thing for different types, there's no mechanism that I'm seeing, at least right here, that would let me specify an interface so that they're all implemented with the same signature. It would just be sort of ad hoc and random where I'm adding something to string, I'm adding something to you know, my personal class, and they may or may not be consistent. So type classes helps us you know, avoid that. So here's an example of, of a type class. I actually adapted this from the Dottie documentation. I should mention that too. If you, if you go to the Dottie doc documentation at EPFL's site, I think it's quite good. Uh, much of what I've learned about Scala 3, I, I read there. Uh, of course, like anything, it's a work in progress. Some things I've, are actually evolving and changing. Uh, other things, uh, other places, the documentation is a little out of date but it's, it's generally quite good for not only examples, but you know, what's actually coming in Scala 3. So here's what we might do to create like a semi-group and a monoid. And I'm assuming this crowd kind of knows what they are, but basically monoid just is a generalization of addition uh, with, with a unit like zero if I'm adding numbers and the addition part is just what I'm gonna call combine or this, I'll add a second method that um, you know, is this funky Darth Vader spaceship TIE fighter, is that what they are? Anyway, something like that. Um, so semi-group, these are the math terms. Semi-group doesn't have the unit and monoid adds the unit. So other than that, these are just regular traits though, as far as we're concerned. Um, but notice what I'm doing. There's a very interesting thing that's going on here. I'm going to make these instance methods and hence I'm declaring these as extension methods, these two right here. Whereas unit, I don't need a separate unit for every single instance. I can just have the equivalent of a companion object instance. So by not declaring this as an extension method, when I actually uh, instantiate this trait, it will become sort of the equivalent of an object 
uh, member. And in fact, it will be an object member as we'll see in just a second. So let me just uh, actually set this up as a script. So let me just paste these in my REPL here. And in case you can't see the bottom that well, I think I'll, no, wrong way. There we go. I'll put this at the top a little bit. So it's maybe a little easier to see for some of you. Uh, and I forgot the import statements. Don't you love it when uh, your examples fail? I'm actually using the uh, Dottie REPL here. And it's it's got some nice features. Like you don't do paste, colon paste anymore. It's gone. You just kind of, you know, get smart enough to figure out what you meant. So that's kind of cool. And now I'll actually instantiate this for strings and integers. I'll just go ahead and paste both of these. These uh, weird comments are part of the, the way the book is built, They're just for sectioning off stuff. But anyway, what you're seeing with given is the alternative to an implicit value. You just say, you know, given a string monoid as monoid, as is a new keyword, then um, now I define what unit means in this case, and I only need to define the combine method because this uh, arrow thingy or plus method just calls combine. Notice again that this is defined um, without the keyword, without the extension part, and this is defined as an extension. I, I didn't come say this maybe enough, but this is the object I'm adding a method to. So I'm adding to the type string and I'm giving it a name S so that I can reference the equivalent of this. Um, and similarly for integers. And notice what the names of these, these objects that are, are uh, output, they're called string monoid and int monoid. Um, and in fact, you can do this, you can do int monoid uh, unit and that's where the unit ended up. Now, if I, it also turns out you can have anonymous ones. So let me just uh, do an anonymous one for doubles here. Oops. Just quickly. And then I'll show you how to actually do this for all numeric types. And I'm using my fancy uh, IDE called Sublime Text here. Oh, I forgot to do this. I don't want, I want to make this uh, anonymous. Oftentimes anonymous is fine. Notice the name. This is actually a standard pattern for the name of the, of the object that's generated. It does have the unit, but that's kind of an ugly name to remember. So that's why I actually gave these names up above. And uh, yeah, we can see that they actually work, that they obey the, you know, I didn't, in this thing, I'm not using Scala check or anything. I'm, I'm just uh, showing you examples of these things in operation and they're, you know, they obey the usual properties of associativity and all the things like that that you may have heard about when you talk about addition. And then just to wrap this up a little bit, these givens can still be parameterized. So if I want to declare one of these givens for all numeric types, this is how you would do it. And now we're going to see how implicit clauses work, uh, parameter uh, list rather. So now I'll do a given numeric monoid of type T and I'm going to pass in a, you know, and it, uh, basically one of these context bounds that we've usually this would be, you know, implicit value of some such thing. Um, and this will be the thing that, that verifies that I can only use this particular instance of the type class for something that's numeric. So there's numeric instances for, you know, in, all the integers, all the doubles, uh, including big decimal and so forth. Oops, I'm in the wrong thing. Still, once again, I gave it the name I want. Uh, actually, to reference the unit, you'd have to like give it something. So let's do this. There's the double. And then now it just works for things like big decimal. OK. Uh, someone asked it that uh, they're wondering if the Dottie REPL is based on Ammonite. That might be true. You know, that's a really good question. I don't actually know uh, if anyone wants to chime in on that. I'd love to hear that, whether that's actually the case. Um, it, it, it is not. It is not, okay. Thanks, Seth. Not to say that it's not a bad rep too, but uh, okay. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? So, so anyway, that's, in, that's sort of a capsule summary of the new facilities. Um, with uh, you know, sort of, it'll eventually replace implicits where you declare given instances, those are like the implicit vowels. Uh, using is the new thing for, um, 
you know, an implicit uh, parameter list. Uh, you, these can also be uh, anonymous. I could leave out the num um, uh, colon if I wanted. And if I wanted then to reference the object, I could either use implicitly, but that's now a bad word, right? So there's also a function now called summon, S-U-M-M-O-N, that you can use to, to grab the instance when you don't have a name for it. Um, so otherwise, things work a lot like they did before. OK. Um, so th this is pretty fun, I think. It's, it's really going to clean up our code a lot, especially extension methods, make it a little bit more uh, intent driven as when you read it versus the, uh, kind of using a lower level mechanism, but basically solving a lot of the, the, the same uh, use cases that we have. Um, okay, let's see, what else can we do here? Um, I apologize that I didn't have as much time to prepare in advance for this as I had planned to, but um, I'll mention a few other things quickly about the syntax and then we'll come back to it. Uh, a lot of times you'll just write stuff like you used to, like you can see um, here I'm doing a, a, on the left hand side, I'm just using a for loop like we had before with the yield statement. So that looks like regular Scala too, but as I said, um, we now have this ability to write this without using um, um, curly braces if we want. Now there is one actual disadvantage of the curly brace thing. And if, let me find my example of that. So one of the cool things about Scala has been that we could write like our own control structures because whenever you, you can always pass arguments to a function using curly braces. So if I write something that's like simulating a while loop where I'm gonna say loop for n number of times and call this function on, the, on, on each index. Um, you know, that, that works kind of the way we would expect it to. If I paste this over here, then, um, you know, what we'd love to be able to do like we used to do in Scala 3 is, you know, maybe n and then, uh, you know, we can do the curly brace thing if we want, like just, just do print. Oh, I think I, I forgot, I have to. Uh... Oh, I need to find N, why don't I just do something for real? All right, there we go. But what we can't do in this new syntax is I'd kind of like to be able to write something like this maybe where I do, you know, to be consistent with the syntax and that doesn't work. So we, we do have to use curly braces for these things. I think there is a pos there, there is some work being done to maybe add this feature, if I recall correctly, but it's uh, kind of more experimental um, than uh, available today. So you're still going to be doing it the old way for a while, most likely, which is fine. Can't have everything like that, right? Okay. Uh, actually, let me bring the, up the book for a second. That'll remind me. So here's like a draft I'm working on where I have, uh, I'm also trying to make this smaller. It was like 600 pages in the last edition and 547 is too big. I actually wanted to get it closer to 500. So uh, it won't quite be a, something that you can use as a weapon, hopefully when it's done. But uh, let's, let me find a few other things in here. Uh, pattern matching is uh, mostly the same, but there are some interesting changes. Um, where did that go? Uh, I, let me just find a good example of that. To, well, one of the things, I'll I can just type this in. Let's just do that. that you, it actually works a little bit better if you want to sequence them. So if I have like, you know, um, let's say, let's just do this. Uh, I'm just sort of making up a kind of a trivial example. Oh, catch is the wrong word, of course. And you can actually chain them, which didn't quite work before. This is obviously pretty basic. You can type. That's interesting. Oh, oh, and I matched on the range. So this is what I really needed to do, right? something like this. 
and I'll just put this in for rather than make it a uh, partial function. May help if I would do this correctly. Sorry, this is a. Uh, Okay, that's a little better. So, but anyway, the point being, you can chain match statements better than you could before. And there's actually a type change that's happened underneath. Um, one of the other things you've heard about is um, is intersection and union types. Let me let's talk about those for a bit. How are we doing for time? Pretty well. Uh, where did I have those type system? Okay, here we go. So that's not one I want to use. No, actually, I want to be down here. Sorry. So I have uh, the way I've restructured the code is uh, now I have um, the usual source main directory tree, and then I also have a script um, directory tree for things that are actually just it's supposed to be evaluated with the REPL. And then some of these are tested. So okay, here we go. So um, one of the things that's changed now is the idea that um, uh, instead of doing like uh, a sort of a path, to, well, path is the wrong word, but if I define these traits and then I do something like this, where I combine them in different orders, the types that actually come back are these intersection types. And what this is saying, if you think about like set theory, um, if I just had C as the type, then valid values would be anything that's in the set of C. But if I add these other mix-ins, then now, not only does that element have to be a member of C, it has to be a member of the set of T1 and a member of the set of T2. So it's actually a more constrained set of values that are allowed. What's interesting about this is that these, the two types here are actually considered to be the same. And in fact, if I wrote something like I have down here, where I, I deliberately uh, put the types completely out of order. These are all considered equivalent types. In other words, they commute in the same way that set, set uh, theory would, um, like intersection union and sets commutes. But the behavior does not necessarily commutes. And I particularly contrived this example. So I have these overloaded M methods that call up the chain and will actually return different results. So if I do uh, C12M for some string, let's just put in one. And then if I do this with C21, notice the uh, uh, control T did the nice little switch of the things there, that's good. Notice that the, uh, the different uh, braces and so forth come out in a different order. So even though these things are equivalent types, they still behave differently based on the linearization that's used to resolve which of the super methods to actually call next. It's kind of interesting. Related to that is union types, although it, even though they're kind of dual in the sense of you replace the, uh, your ampersand with a, uh, a vertical bar, they're actually used more like replacing either's than something that you know, would work close to what we're writing here. So let me just define a few types here and a few values for like some good result and some bad result where the bad result might be the message that comes out of an exception. And the way I could then declare the sequence of elements where I'm mixing good and bad things in um, the sequence is by using this syntax here, good or bad. Notice that by default, if I don't annotate the type on the sequence that infers the uh, object. Uh, and this is actually a quirk in the compiler. I ask on the uh, Scala, um, um, get, uh, get uh, one of the mailing lists, I forget what it was. Anyway, and it actually should probably say any ref, but any ref and object are basically the equivalent. So that's what it in, it's inferring in this case because these two types are unrelated. So it goes all the way up to the type hierarchy. But in fact, this is the real least upper bound right here, is uh, good or bad. And it's sort of equivalent in a way to, you know, sequence of either good or bad kind of types. So it's, a, a, it's an alternative for doing that. So if I process these, let me do some work here where, you know, if you pass me an integer greater than zero, then I'll say that's bad. The integer should be less than or equal to zero, else I'll return good. You know, typical sort of thing you might do with an either. 
and then um, but now here's the trick of how you have to work with these things just as with either's where you pattern match whether it's a left or right you don't have to do that left or right wrapper around the real thing anymore it's now either just a good or a bad so uh, it works it works conceptually the same way but it's a little bit more concise to work with it this way so it's kind of a nice tool I don't, you know, we'll see how much people um, migrate to this versus using either's or something equivalent. Um, obviously, if you're doing, it does give you a little bit more flexibility, but um, we'll just see. I kind of like it because it does make it a little bit more concise. Now, let's see a few other questions. Uh, oh, Gitter. Yeah, thank you for uh, reminding me of the thing I could not remember, even though it started with the word Git. There. Okay. Once again, this also, uh, I just, this, this is a list of stuff that just shows that everything is associative and it also commutes and I forgot to define these types. Um, and we also have this type equivalence because they commute, because they um, are associative, um, they, they uh, uh, commute. Now there's some interesting stuff though that happens uh, let me see if I, oh yeah, when we talk about contravariance, this is kind of interesting. So let's talk about a contravariant function and what happens there. So I'm defining a function that's gonna take either a T1, a T2, or a T3 and return a string. Oh, I should grab the whole thing. Let's do this, sorry. Once again, I have to pattern match on it. This is equivalent to this type. In other words, you know, uh, when you have something in contravariant position, like these types here, like this tuple type. Well, no, it's it's a uh, uh, it's a it's a, a union type. It's equivalent to this distributed rule. Yeah, you know, there's this rule of distribution in arithmetic. Like normally, you know, a times parenthesis b plus c is a b times plus b c. Well, here. This is how it actually works. The, the ors of the unions get converted into ands, and then um, these, these types and the return type permute through like so. So this is the distributed rule for covariant, um, or sorry, contravariant types in, in an expression like this. Looks completely weird. What is this actually saying? It's saying that the only valid function that I could assign to something of this type is it has to be a function that can take a T1 and it can take a T2 and it can take a T3 and return a string. <clears throat> and uh, so if we try some, a sequence like that, let's not delete it. Did I just paste uh, I pasted the wrong thing, sorry. All right, let me, uh, where did I define this? Oh, here it goes. So here's a, here's a sequence of these things. And now I can do this. And they both return the same thing. Where they just, these are just strings now. So this is pretty strange, the way that, I mean, it takes a bit of thinking to, to kind of you know, work out the mental model of why this uh, works. You could try a truth table, for example, to kind of uh, piece it together. Uh, the, the fact that I picked a function which adds all of these you know, arrow string things makes it a little harder to grok what's going on. But if you, for, if you kind of ignore those for a second, then um, you know, it's basically saying that this maps to uh, you know, these, these grouping expressions with uh, and instead of or, or vertical bar instead of uh, this. So that's, co that's contravariant uh, behavior. Covariant behavior is a little bit more obvious. Um, you know, if I have an array of these things, I think it's probably the same one I just pasted. Then, um, uh, actually, I forget what I did here. Uh, let me just go on. It's actually a little bit easier to follow what's going on here. Um, oh, actually, this is the this is why this is there. Let me just comment on this for a second. So the reason this is invalid is because we're basically saying that the sequence will always contain T ones, but I've given it a sequence where some of the items are in fact T2s or could be, or they could be T3s. So that's why, you know, we'll obviously avoid surprises, which is what type systems are all about. 
uh, this, this is not a valid assignment. Even though you might sort of look at this and say, oh, T1 or these others, well, okay, I'll just pick T1. No, can't do that. Okay, um, any other questions? Can you have string and none? Would that be useful when you don't want to wrap option string? Um, the, so if you had something like this, let's like say val x string or none, um, you could do something like this, but these would be com treated completely independently. So in the sense that, and keep in mind what I showed up here, where you, where you know, how do you actually work with something like this? Well, you end up doing pattern matching like here. So you probably don't gain that much if it's just trying to eliminate having a sum in there. You probably end up still having to do case string or case none. So that probably doesn't buy you a lot. However, there is um, now the ability to do stuff like this. You can declare something as either a string or a null. And uh, I don't, I'm not actually using this as, there's a compiler flag that makes this a bit more uh, precise that I'm actually not using in the code because it tripped up things like um, uh, lazy infinite recursions. Like there's this famous example of defining the Fibonacci numbers as an infinite sequence folded on itself kind of thing. And that actually trips up the type checking with this one apparently. But you do have this ability now that you could um, basically be very explicit about what's allowed to be null. And it's of course designed to support uh, interop with libraries where that's allowed. Uh, someone asked too about when you need none type. Yeah, th this is the one that I've tripped over already. Like you wouldn't, um, I think case none works, but sometimes you actually, if you have an object you're working with, sometimes doing none.type gives you what you want when you need to say something of a certain type. I think maybe like this, which is a bit weird looking, but this is what you have to write if you were, if you wanted to like capture the value or something. Anyway. Rid of that. Okay. That's interesting. Someone mentioned that in React, it's common to see methods that take string or uh, by name string or int. Okay. So I think you could, most of the time, you should be able to uh, just write, you know, a, a by name function and then pass it a string. I'm not sure why you need both, but maybe there's a reason for it. The int I can understand something entirely different, but you will have to be pattern matching on what you were given to know what you've got. All right. Um, there are some things that are uh, I haven't really spent a lot of time learning about yet, but uh, so I, I'm a little hesitant to get into too much. But we do have, uh, I, here it is, get, uh, the uh, um, Gitter web page. But if you go to the Dottie documentation, you'll see there's a lot of stuff about type lambdas, for example, uh, which is kind of cool for dealing you know, more effectively with higher kind of types than we've been able to do before, without having to necessarily always turn to uh, whatever Miles Saban is doing today or tomorrow. So let me, uh, let me click through a few things here to see what I want to throw in. There is a new enumeration syntax, which is pretty nice. So you'll now be able to write stuff like this, which is a little, I can never actually remember the Scala 2 syntax. I kind of, maybe now I do because I've done it enough, but this is a lot more direct about how to write enumerations. And my understanding too, is that this is actually uh, basically compiled to Java enumerations so that they're more interoperable as well. And you can define methods on them. Uh, there's kind of a cool example with uh, an enumeration for the planets. You give constructor arguments and so forth. Let me see if I missed anything under cont contextual abstractions that I want to. Oh yeah, here's a kind of a cool feature, given imports. Uh, the way that you'll do uh, imports now, when you want to import these, what used to be implicit values is, is explicitly say uh, import something dot given. If you just do import something dot underscore, it will not import those implicit values. And that the rationale for this is that it gives you a little bit more control over what's being brought into scope. Uh, so that you, you, know, you see this and you know that there's some of these given uh, values that are coming into scope. Whereas before, you know, import underscore, you just didn't really know. You had to have some way of figuring it out when, it, when these things showed up. 
and there's a little bit more about um, you can say I just want to I, I need a given I know that it's of type X and I know that this package happens to have it so this is what I'm going to import to get that thing whatever it's called I don't care okay Seth mentioned that if you want a, a Java if you want Java style enumerations you extend Java lang enum so that's something I need to add to the book I guess Actually, I'm kind of following the philosophy of Scala. You appeal more to Python programmers, so I'm not really mentioning Java quite as much as I used to in previous editions. Um, I'm sort of on the on the argument that I'm not sure how many more Java developers will come over to the Scala fold like in the past, but but I think we'll probably bring in people from other uh, communities like data science types who you know we're told they had to use Scala for their data pipelines, but are used to using Python. So. Okay, um, we talked about type classes. I think this is the one, uh, this is a different example. There's a way now, uh, if you know Haskell, type class derivation is the idea that I could say, I want my tree type to derive equality, ordering, and so forth. And then the compiler will just generate the type class stuff for you. And you won't have to do that explicit thing that I showed you a minute ago. Um, that uh, I think that when I last time I tried this, it actually only worked for this new EQ uh, type class. It actually wasn't supported yet for the other two. That may just be the effect that, that you know that's not quite uh, the library itself isn't quite fleshed out yet for the final 3.0 release. But that that'll be kind of nice that we can do stuff like this and not have to you know explicitly provide the boilerplate for some of these things. So that's what type class derivation is about: is just auto generating some of these things. Equality in this case would be a way of being, being having a more precise equality check that uh, is more tight uh, aware and so forth. Similarly, this leads into multiversal equality, speaking of equality, where um, now we'll have an ability to provide a much more precise way of checking equality rather than just doing it at the any val or, or rather the uh, any ref level. And uh, this also involves, there's a compiler flag that I think is mentioned in here to turn this on Whereas if you leave it off, um, it won't be quite as strict. I think this will be a nice evolution of, of avoiding mistakes when we do comparisons, which uh, any of us in the programming world learn after a while that it's far more, far non-trivial to do comparisons than, than it seems at first. Um, let's see, let me, uh, well, I think we're getting close to the hour, so I want to kind of wrap up. There is a totally new uh, metaprogramming facility now available, a uh, new way of writing macros. If, you're, if you write macro-heavy code, this might be the area where you spend most of your time upgrading from, say, 213 to Scala 3 is, uh, you know, uh, the way that this is handled. Um, actually, I saw some comments on Gitter the other day about uh, uh, Rob Norris was going through this exercise with some of his code. And actually went faster than uh, maybe he expected. But and finally, I'll, I'll mention maybe some drop features, and then maybe we can take some questions. Uh, I do encourage you just to browse this website because it's really quite good at explaining a lot of stuff that's changing. Um, we've they've added um, parameters to traits, and so a lot of the reasons for having the delayed uh, init feature, where you could have this block that's evaluated, uh, sort of in before some other things happen like constructor calls, that's gone because it's not really needed anymore. The old uh, macro facility has been replaced with uh, the new features. They've also gotten rid of existential types. So there won't be this for some construct anymore. Um, uh, it really wasn't as needed as, uh, as we thought. Uh, I won't click through all of these actually. Some of these, some of them are pretty obvious. We knew that procedure syntax was gonna go away eventually where you didn't have an equal sign. Um, uh, here's an interesting one now, because now it's easy to just define types and so forth at any point in the code, package objects aren't really as useful anymore. So these are actually gone. Uh, instead, you would just do something like this instead of defining a, a package object like we did before. Uh, another big change is the, uh, the 22 field limit for functions and tuples is gone. But uh, beyond 22, these new types, tuple XXL for t-shirt size, I guess, and function XSL will be used instead. And there's some kind of cool features added to tuples as well. You can do operations like create a new tuple by appending an element to an existing tuple like uh, we've always done with lists and so forth. 
to some new behaviors there. I know all of you will be sad to know that XML literals have been dropped. Sorry, can't have everything. Um, symbol literals also have been dropped, which is probably a good thing uh, because I don't think they were used that much. And I, I actually came from the Ruby community after I uh, did Java and then Ruby for a while and came to Scala and actually really liked using colon for uh, symbols and, uh, in Ruby, but that of course would collide with the type annotations. Um, and auto application is about uh, sort of auto tuppling, as I recall. Um, and now you'll have to be a little bit more precise about applying arguments, even if it's an empty argument list, and about converting to and from tuples. And uh, if you do the qualification of private and protected, they've, they've also dropped uh, this uh, qualifier because it's effectively uh, unnecessary. You can, uh, you can get around it with other things. All right, so there's a comment here. Martin Dursky is really promoting the new function types with implicit parameters, uh, context functions. His example about making the usage simpler than reader monad was a cool one. Yeah, I need, that's an area where I need to spend some time understanding it a little better. Uh, that's discussed and under con contextual abstractions that's discussed here, context functions. There is actually, yeah, there's a really cool example. That's right. Um, how you could use this mechanism to do like a very nice little mini DSL. And so they, they implement an example here for that. Um, <clears throat> uh, and a new, slightly new syntax. Notice how this type is declared up here with this uh, question mark equals um, greater than sign. Let's see. Uh, super traits is kind of a cool idea. Um, it kind of gets rid of this thing where you'd enter, you know, you declare a value and the REPL says that it's also of type uh, product and serializable and so forth. Traits that are declared uh, with the super keyword just are omitted from that type inference. Um, and, and so that also makes it easier to like declare that you expect an argument of type foo and you pass something that has a different type because it's got traits mixed in that you don't really care about for, for type checking, those sort of things. Uh, here's the section about explicit nulls that I talked about a little bit, where you can, you know, explicitly say that something could be a null. And um, and there's also a flag to uh, try to trip up or try to catch cases where you haven't initialized things safely. This is um, also triggered by a compiler flag. Yeah, this this new flag y check init. Actually, maybe it was this one that was tripping up um, my uh, view example of an infinite definition of uh, Fibonacci sequences. I think it was actually this one, not the, uh, the, the, uh, the null checking, explicit null stuff that I mentioned earlier. So that was a mistake. All right, anyway, I've been kind of rambling a bit lately. Um, was there any other questions uh, that anyone wanted to bring up or other particular features that you've seen that uh, you want to mention? Is anyone actually using the new syntax without braces and stuff? And what are your thoughts about that? Uh, opaque types, that's a really great one. Let me quickly talk about that. This is a, um, a, a better way of doing what any vowel was designed to do, where you extend an any vowel and you don't create a wrapper. That actually didn't quite work as well. This opaque type idea is that I could give a type like logarithm, but it's actually gonna be properly handled as a a primitive, basically a JVM double uh, on the, the stack, uh, you know, inlined in an array and not in a, you know, a wrapper type. So this is, a, I'm glad you brought that up because this is one of my favorite changes is this idea that we can, you know, have these very lightweight domain specific types, but they're actually as efficient as if we had used something like a primitive instead. And that's the idea with this new opaque type. Uh, match type, I, um, is the change that they made to also do things like make it easier to chain match expressions. Um, uh, no, sorry, got that wrong. Match types are, I think that's up here, yeah. So you can do crazy stuff like this. So notice this type declaration for element uh, where you match on X and then um, return a different type based on what X is. So it could be a character as an element of a string, um, or a, before just an array, it's just a T or something like that. So this is a, another uh, change to the type system. That's kind of cool.
Let's see, someone's asking, can you talk about the new tuple? Can we write or at least match on tuples in a flat manner, even if they are nested differently? Um, I'm not entirely sure what's changed here. I don't know if you have any comments about this, Seth. This thing in the, this question in the chat. Um, any, any other questions, comments, criticisms, complaints, things you wish were done but weren't? The Scala 3. Do match types work with opaque types? I think they do because if, unless I'm mistaken, they, they are type checked in the same way. But um, the, the uh, implementation is, again, this underlying uh, native type. Oh, flat mapping tuple. Sorry, let's try that. Yeah, I forgot how this works. Actually, if you do this, so there are some new methods now on tuple. And I think, I believe flat map, or maybe it was just map is one uh, where I can do. Uh, Let's do this. Have to do this. I, I played with this a little bit one day and now I forgot how it has to work. Yeah, anyway, as you saw a minute ago, there are some new methods now that let you treat tuples a little bit more like um, regular collections. You can see the list here. Oh, right, it, it takes a poly function, yeah. Um, and I forget the syntax for those, but there are ways that, to handle this. Uh, so you can actually do mapping over tuples. <clears throat> Anything else anyone has? Thanks for looking forward to, to the new book, uh, available at a dealer near you sometime eventually soon. Thank I would you. buy the ebook, quite frankly, you know. <laughs> Let's thank Dean again. And guys, feel free to um, ask any questions now by voice or say anything uh, you want to share. For one, I wanted to ask you guys, uh, we did this lunchtime meetup, right? Because we are in the virtual space where space and time no matter anymore. And we're in the land of eternal youth in California. Anyways, you know, the time was meaningless here. Uh, forever. So, but I just wanted to ask you all if this time slot works, right? Because I mean, obviously, we had a record showing, we had uh, more than 60 people uh, uh, showing up, which is pretty high for this online uh, setting. So, what's good about this is it's a kind of nominal lunch time in, in um, California. It's kind of uh, afternoon in uh, East Coast. And again, you know, Kind of still kind of lunchtime ish in 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 uh, Chicago, and it also works for some kind of not too late people in in Europe. So I just wanted to to ask you guys if if, if you would rather keep this time slot. Rest right? so of the options are Salar, our wonderful co organizer, was actually pioneering early breakfast meetups, which is like eight a.m. Pacific time, which is even more conducive of Europe and and East Coast. But we, we did not see too many people, uh, although on Twitch we had actually, I think, 100 people. Like, so, so, I mean, it, it really depends, right? So uh, just wanted to ask you guys, what do you think? Um, does anybody have a preference uh, early morning kind of breakfast uh, time slot, uh, uh, this uh, kind of time slot, uh, or... Uh, you know, evening kind of traditional physical meetups are, you know, 5, 6 p.m. Does anyone have a preference? Someone said, I think it is a nice break, you know, in the middle of the day, if you're breaking for lunch, it's a good time to geek out a little bit in a different way. Mm -hmm. Just my Yeah, I mean, it certainly works for me. And it's like, it's not too early. It's not too late Pacific time, right? Um, so if you guys kind of like it, maybe we may keep it at this uh, time. So yeah, so folks are, um, I see folks are um, answering in, in the chat. Great time, not a bad time. 
Okay. I have to drop off to fight a work emergency, but I th thanks for the opportunity to talk and hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Dean, and we're looking forward to next week in case you guys uh, following, we have Reactive Summit on Tuesday and uh, uh, we actually accommodate the panel with Dean uh, is the future reactive there. And then we have obviously Scale by the Bay um, Thursday and Friday, right? And this I'm doing a Python talk. There you go. Yeah. Yes, Array, right? Which is- yeah, Array, an interesting so distributed framework. Exactly. So you guys are all welcome to join. Again, I dropped the code uh, SFScala20 for 20% off of that uh, in the chat. Uh, feel free to register and send as many of your coworkers as, as you like. We will have like obviously a nominal price this year. So uh, great. Got to go. See y'all. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, guys.